part of lesson 3.1, we will express the force between electrical charges in a mathematical form and make calculations. And uh, the law that enables us to do that is called Coulomb's law. We will discuss Coulomb's law, which describes the relation between force between electric charges. Now, I have a very light plastic ball in here, and I can actually charge it by induction by bringing a charged plastic sheet. I'm trying to see if I can charge the plastic sheet by rubbing it. And you know, when I bring it close to the neutral object, it's going to get charged. Is that right? Now, see what happens. There you are. You see what happened? It came and touched the plastic and went away. Now, why did it go away? Look what happens when I bring the plastic near. Now, this object now has the same charge as the plastic because it came and touched it. That means it obtained charges by conduction. So here I have a negative charge and a negative charge. What happens when a negative charge is brought near a negative charge? Look at that, it goes away. Now, Coulomb's law deals with the magnitude of this electric force. Now, what is the magnitude of the electric force between two charges when they are separated by a certain distance? You can see here, this is a repulsive force because they are both like charges. On the other hand, if one is positive and the other is negative, the force will be an attractive force. All right, what does Coulomb's law say? Coulomb's law gives us a quantitative description of the force on one point charge due to another point charge. You must understand Coulomb's law only deal with interaction between point charges, not extended charges. Now this is the statement of Coulomb's law. The law says the force between two point charges varies directly as the product of the two charges and inversely as the square of the distance between their centers. How do I represent that? If Q1 and Q2 are the two charges separated by distance R, Coulomb's law gives us a quantitative measure of this force. Now can you write this as a mathematical equation? This force varies directly as the product of the two charges, Q1 times Q2, and inversely as the square of this distance. So I can write it as F equal to a constant times Q1, Q2 divided by R squared. There you are. So if a charge Q1 is separated by a distance R, from a charge Q2, the force between them is given by F equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. And of course this K is a constant. Can you tell me the unit of this K? How do you find the unit? Look at that. I can solve K like this. F R squared divided by Q1, Q2. Therefore the unit of K will be Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. That's right. And it has a value. I want you to remember this value. The value of K is 9 times 10 to the power of 9. You see, that's a very easy number to remember. Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. <coughs> There you are. That is the mathematical statement of Coulomb's law. K can also be expressed in terms of another constant. And this is another important constant in electricity. K equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And what does epsilon naught represent? Epsilon naught is called the permittivity of free space. What is the meaning of permittivity? Well, 
You see, this charge is able to exert a force on this charge because the medium in between permits the electrical influences to pass through. Some medium do it more efficiently than other mediums. So it is this quantity that represents how efficient the medium is in transmitting the electrical forces. So epsilon zero is called the permittivity of free space. And uh, this is the value of that epsilon naught. 8.84 times 10 to the negative 12 Coulomb squared per Newton per meter squared. So sometimes we will represent this K as it is. What will be the value of that K then? It will be 9 times 10 to the power of 9. Now, some other times we will write this k as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, and this is the value of epsilon naught. You must be familiar with both these forms. And that means if you, if you now replace this k by this value, the force between the two charges will be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q1 q2 over r squared. Now we will be using this form in most of the calculations today but later on we will look at that. All right. Now at the moment remember the value of k as 9 times 10 to the power of 9 newton meter squared per coulomb squared. The statement of Coulomb's law only gives you the magnitude of the force between the charges. The direction of the force between the two charges is obtained by knowing the interaction. A negative charge repels a negative charge. That means the direction is that the force is directed away from each other. Whereas a positive charge attracts a negative charge the direction of the force is directed towards each other. So, when we calculate the force between two charges, we need to find the magnitude by using the Coulomb's law formula, and we also need to find the direction by using this concept. Force is a vector quantity. We need to describe a force by its magnitude, and direction. Let's do a problem. Three point charges are on the x-axis q1 equal to negative 6 microcoulomb at x equal to negative 3 meter, q2 equal to 4 microcoulomb at the origin, and q3 equal to negative 6 microcoulomb at x equal to 8 meter. Find the force on Q3 due to the other two charges. Well, here is the picture of that. Q1 is negative 6 microcoulomb. Apparently, my PowerPoint did a very nasty thing here for me. Well, you know what happened? I changed over to uh, Office 2007. And apparently, it doesn't like what the earlier version did. This is supposed to be micro Coulomb. So I'm expecting all the micro mu to appear as m in the presentation. So please take note of that. This is negative 6 micro Coulomb. Q2 is 4 micro Coulomb. Q3 is negative 6 micro Coulomb not millicoulomb as it says here. Alright, so watch that. Okay, well apparently those were not affected, but these are affected. Anyway, what do we do? We will use some notation, so let's explain what that notations are. We will use the notation F31 for the force on Q3 by Q1. Alright, so what does F31 stands for? Force on Q3 by Q1. F32 stands for force on Q3 by Q2. And 
R23 stands for distance between charges 2 and 3. R13 stands for distance between charges 1 and 3. All right, let's use that and now find expressions for each of those. What is R13? R13 is the distance between Q1 and Q3, 8 plus 3, 11 meter. R23, distance between Q2 and Q3 is 8 meter. And therefore, F31 is KQ1 Q3 over R13 squared. I hope you understand that notation. Force on 3 due to charge 1 equal to K times Q1 Q3 divided by square of the distance between Q1 and Q3. And we know all these values. K is 9 times 10 to the 9. We know the value of Q1. Now, look at this. Q1 is negative 6 microcoulomb. It is 6 times 10 to the negative 6 coulomb. Microcoulomb needs to be converted to coulomb. Why didn't I use the negative sign there? Because our first aim is to obtain the magnitude of the force. We will obtain the direction by entirely different method. So we will ignore the negative sign now. Therefore, KQ1 Q3 over R13 squared is this quantity. And that is 0 0.0027 Newton I. Now, how did I arrive at this conclusion? I have assigned a direction for it. This is a negative charge. The force on Q3 by Q1 is an attractive force. That means it is directed in the positive x direction. So this is in the positive x direction because it is a repulsive force. Yes, is it true? Q3 is negative 6 microcoulomb. Okay. Why is this force in the positive x direction? You can see the force on Q3 by Q1, they are both negative charges. It is a repulsive force. So Q1 will repel Q3, which direction? In the positive x direction. So the force on Q3 by Q1 is a positive x force. 0 0.0027 Newton I. You see, x vectors are represented by using the unit vector I. Y vectors are represented by using the unit vector J. I suppose you know that from physics 1. All right, so F31 is 0 0.0027 Newton in the positive x direction. How about F32? Force on Q3 by Q2. Force on a negative charge by a positive charge is an attractive force. Now, using the values of K, Q2, and Q3, and of course the distance between them, we get that force as negative 0.0034 Newton I. How do I know this is a negative x force? Well, I know it because Q3 is a negative charge, Q2 is a positive charge, the force on Q3 by Q2 is an attractive force. Q2 will attract Q3, so it is a negative x force. F32 is negative 0.0034. Newton I. We got now two X forces. We can find the sum of the two forces. The net force therefore is the positive X force minus, well, the two X forces are added. One is positive, the other is negative. That gives you the net force on Q3 is a negative X force negative 7 times 10 to the negative 4 Newton I. 
I hope you understood the method of doing this problem. Once you know this basic method, we can use it for any other difficult types of problems. Now, in calculating the force between electric charges, we use the absolute value of the charges. That means we will not consider positive or negative signs of the charges. We will calculate the magnitude of the force and then determine the direction depending on whether the force is an attractive force or a repulsive force, like we did here. Let's do another problem. A charge Q1 equal to 5 microcoulomb is on the y-axis. A charge Q1 equal to 5 microcoulomb is on the y-axis at y equal to 3 meter. Now, this is the 5 microcoulomb. And the charge Q2 equal to negative 5 microcoulomb is at y equal to negative 3. This is my charge Q2. Find the force on a charge Q3 equal to 2 microcoulomb located at x equal to 8 meter. There you are. All right. We will use the same argument like the one we used before. But look at this. We need the distance between charges Q1 and Q3. If you notice, this is the origin. This distance is 3 meter and this distance is 8 meter and therefore this is the hypotenuse of that triangle. R13 squared. What does R13 stands for? Distance of charge Q1 from Q3. R13 squared is 8 squared plus 3 squared equal to 73. So where in the calculation we need the square of this distance, we will use 73. Now similarly, R23 squared also is 73. 8 squared plus 3 squared. Okay, what is R13 squared? 73. R23 squared is 73 and therefore what is F31? What does F31 stands for? Force on charge 3 by charge 1 will be KQ1Q3 divided by R13 squared. We know all these. Q1 is 5 microcoulomb, 5 times 10 to the negative 6 of a coulomb. There you are. K times Q1, Q3, Q3 is 2 microcoulomb, divided by R13 squared. What is that equal to? 0 0.0012 Newton. The force on Q3 by Q1 is this quantity. And now you know you need to find the direction. What is the direction of this force? Q1 is a positive charge. Q3 also is a positive charge. Therefore, the force on Q3 by Q1, will it be an attractive force or a repulsive force? They are both positive charges. Therefore, it will be a repulsive force. The force on Q3 will be directed away from Q1, repulsive force. So this is the repulsive force and so is directed like this. This is the direction of the force on Q3 by Q1. All right, let's now find F32. F32, the force on 3 by 2 will be a similar quantity. All these quantities are the same. And that also equal to 0 0.0012 in which direction? It will be, this is a, now Q2 is a negative charge, if you remember, and Q3 is a positive charge. What is the direction of the force on Q3 by Q2? Q2 will be attracting Q3. Therefore, this force, point zero zero one two will be an attractive force 
This is an attractive force and is so directed towards Q2. Alright? That will be F32. While the force on Q3 by Q1 is a repulsive force, the force on Q3 by Q2 is an attractive force. And now, we have now two force vectors. You need to find the sum of the two force vectors. Now, you know how to find the sum of two vectors. What you need to do is express this vector in the angle, in the component form. How do we represent a vector in the component form? Knowing the angle, well, let me re refresh your memory. If you have a vector like this that makes an angle theta with the x-axis, if this is the vector f, then its component form will be f cos theta i plus f sine theta j. That is the x component and the y component. So a vector f that makes an angle theta with the positive x-axis can be written in the component form as f cos theta i, that is the x component, plus f sine theta j, that is the y component. All right? I suppose you know that very well. Now, we know the magnitude of each of these forces. Now we need to find the angle. Once you know the angle, we can represent them like this. All right, let's find the angle these vectors make with the x-axis. The net force on Q3 is the resultant of F31 and F32, which means the vector sum of these two forces. To write them in the component form, we need the angle they make with the x-axis. Now look at this. F31 is this angle. Can you see where I'm pointing? That's the angle F31 makes with the x-axis. And F32 makes this angle. That's the third quadrant angle. Let's find those angles. All right, I have the diagram made bigger now. If theta is the angle F32, let's do this first. This is the angle theta F32 makes with the x-axis. This is the x-axis. That is the angle we are looking for. Well, let's find just this angle. Is that right? Once you know this angle, add 180 to that, you get the whole angle. So, let's find this angle. Can you find this angle? If this angle is theta, then tan theta will be 3 divided by 8. Is that right? Tan theta equal to 3 divided by 8. Therefore, theta is tan inverse of 3 divided by 8. Do it on your calculator. That gives me 20.6 degrees. If this angle is 20.6 degrees, what is the whole angle that is this whole angle? The angle F31, the angle F31 is 180 plus, you see this is 180 plus 20.6 degrees, that is 200.6 degrees is this angle. So this angle, the, the force vector F32 makes with the x-axis, is 200.6 degrees. Now tell me, we obtained this angle, this acute angle as 20.6 degrees. Can you therefore tell me what this angle will be? That will be negative 20.6 degrees. How do I know that? Well, watch this one here. Let me see if I can show that to you. If I produce this line, there you are, this angle will be theta. Now, if uh, you can see, if you produce that line, this is the x-axis, this angle will be theta, and 
you can see the symmetry of the diagram tells us that if this is theta, that also will be theta. Now, but this angle is a negative angle because it is the fourth quadrant angle. So the angle, this force vector F31 makes with the x-axis is negative 20.6 degrees. I hope you followed my argument. So once again, the angle made by force vector F32 with the x-axis is 200.6 degrees and the angle the force vector F31 makes with the x-axis is negative 20.6 degrees. All right, once you have the angle, we can, we know the magnitude of these two force, each of them has a magnitude of 0 0.0012. So let's write each of them in the component form. F31 is 0 0.0012 cos negative 20.6 degrees I plus 0 0.0012 sine negative 20.6 degrees J. In other words, it is made up of the X component and Y component. And use your calculator to work it out. That gives me 0 0.0011 Newton I, the X component. That is this, 0 0.0011 Newton minus 0 0.00042 Newton J. That is the Y component, this one. 0 0.00042. You can see the Y component, I can either have it here or here. So we wrote F31 in the component form. Let's write F32 in the component form. F32 will be 0 0.0012 cos 200.6 degrees I plus 0 0.0012 sine 200.6 degrees J. And use your calculator to work this out. Remember to keep your calculator in degree mode when you do that. That will be negative 0 0.0011 Newton I. That is the X component. You see this? Minus 0 0.0042 Newton J. That is the Y component. Now if you look at this diagram, look at the X component. There's a positive 0 0.001 Newton and a negative 0 0.001 Newton. They cancel each other. So when you want to find the vector sum F31 added to F32, you notice the X components will add to give you zero. One is positive, the other is an equal negative. And the Y components are both negative. Look at this. And they will both add, will give you a bigger negative value. All right. So F net is F31 plus F32. And that will be negative. Just add the Y values. The X's will cancel. Negative 0 0.00084 Newton J is the net force on Q3 by both these charges. Okay? I want you to practice these kind of problems. It's a very important type of problems. Another one. Three charges, each of magnitude three nanocoulomb, are separated are at the separate corners of a square of five centimeter. The two charges at the opposite corners are positive and the other charge is negative. Find the force exerted by these charges on a fourth charge Q4 equal to 3 nanocoulomb at the remaining corner. Now what I would like you to do is now stop the video now and see if you can picture, if you can draw a diagram of this. You have a square, you have a 
two, three charges of three nano coulomb are at the three corners of a square. Now, the two of those at the opposite corners are positive, and you need to find the force exerted by these three charges on a fourth charge of equal quantity placed at the fourth corner. Now, here is the diagram. I have Q1, can you see this? Q1 is 3 nano coulomb. There is Q2, there is Q3, and there is Q4. We have said the two charges at the opposite corners are positive. So if Q1 is positive, then Q3 is positive. Q2 is negative. All right, we need to find the force on Q4. All right, let's first of all figure out the distances. We need to find the force on Q4 by Q1. That means you need to know the distance between them, R14. That is the side of the side of the square, which is 5 centimeter, 0 0.05 meter. Then we need to find the force on Q, Q4 by Q3. The distance between them is again 5 centimeter, 0 0.05 meter. R34. Now, you need the distance between charge Q2 and Q4. What is that distance? This is the diagonal of this right triangle. That means this R24 squared, the distance between charge Q2 and Q4 is what we call R24. The square of this distance is square of this plus the square of this 0 0.05 squared plus 0 0.05 squared. Can you do that and tell me if this is true? R24 squared is 0 0.005 meter. So now we have all three distances. What are the forces we need to find? We need to find F Four one force on Q4 by Q1. We need to find F4 F4 three force on Q4 by Q3, and we need to find F4 two force on Q4 by Q2, and then find the vector sum of these forces. All right, let's get going. F4 one the force on charge 4 by charge 1 is K Q1 Q4 they are both the same divided by R1 4 squared right and that is 3.24 times 10 to the negative 5 Newton I well if you calculate this quantity on the calculator you will get this number how do I know this is a positive X force? Q1 is a positive charge. Q4 is a positive charge. Therefore, the force on Q4 by Q1 will be a repulsive force. It will be directed away from Q4. There you are. It's directed away from Q1. So this is force F41 which is equal to this 3.24 times 10 to the negative 5 Newton I. Similarly, let's find F43. F43 equal to K Q3, that is 3 times 10 to the negative 9. Remember 3 nano, nano coulomb, 3 times 10 to the negative 9, times, this is also 3 nano coulomb, 3 times 10 to the negative 9 over 0 0.05 squared. Now, sometimes some part on the screen may be cut off. That's why I want you to keep the PowerPoint printed in front of you when you watch these lectures. Now, what does the magnitude of this give you? The same as this. That will be negative 3.24 times 10 to the negative 5 J. 
Well, 3.24 times 10 to the negative 5 is the magnitude of this. How do I know it is a negative y force? Because Q3 is positive, Q4 also is positive, the force on Q4 by Q3 is a repulsive force. That means it will be directed away from Q3 in the negative y direction. That is how I get the direction. I hope you understand that. So F43 is negative 3.24 times 10 to the negative 5 Newton J. Let's now find F42. Can you do that on your own? Well, F42 will be K times Q2 is 3 times 10 to the negative 9. We are not using that negative. We use the absolute value. 3 nanocoulomb times 3 nanocoulomb. We converted that to coulombs. Divided by R24 squared is 0 0.005. And that gives you 1.62 times 10 to the negative 5 newton. Now you can see I haven't put I or J there. Why? Because I don't know yet. What is the direction of this force? Now, Q2 is a negative charge. Q4 is a positive charge. So Q4 will be attracted by Q2 because Q2 is a negative charge. So this force will be directed away from Q4 and makes an angle with the x-axis. This is, it will be directed from Q4 to Q3 because it is an attractive force. A negative charge attracts a positive charge. So F42 will be directed from Q4 to Q2. And what is this angle? That will be very simple to find why this is a right angle 90 degrees and this right angle is bisected here so this will be 45 degrees so this angle total angle will be 90 plus 45 135 degrees okay now we need to write this in the component form can you help me write that in the component form this is the magnitude 1.62 times 10 to the negative 5 and 135 degrees is the angle. Let's do that. The angle is 135 degrees. Alright, let's write that in the component form. F42 written in the component form will be the magnitude times cos 135 degrees I plus the magnitude times sine 135 degrees. The magnitude is 1.62 times 10 to the negative 5 times cos 135 degrees I plus 1.62 times 10 to the negative 5 sine 135 degrees J. Alright, let's work it out. That will be negative 1.15 times 10 to the 5i. So the x component is a negative force. And the y component is plus 1.15 times 10 to the negative 5j. That is a positive component. So we already calculated this. F41, I'm writing that again. F41 is this force which is 3.24 times 10 to the negative uh, 5 Newton I and F43 is this and now you have F41, F43, F42 the vector sum of these forces are simply the sum of these three can you add this, this and this what you should do is Add the x components, that means the ones that contains the i, and then add the ones that contains j. So, f41 plus f42 
plus F43 equal to, I want you to watch the way I write it. Now the I component, I write it like this. 3.24 times 10 to the negative 5, that is positive. Minus 1.15 times 10 to the negative 5 I. You see that? This is the total X component. Now plus, I now find the total Y component. What will that be? This is positive Y, this is negative Y. That will be 1.15 times 10 to the negative 5 minus 3.24 times 10 to the negative 5 J. So the total X component plus the total Y component. All right. Can you use your calculator to work this out? That gives me 2.09 times 10 to the negative 5 I minus 2.09 times 10 to the negative 5 J. This is the component form of the total force. Now, you need to bring it to the magnitude angle form. We will do that in the next slide. So the net force in the component form is this. How do we represent that in the magnitude angle form? Well, this is the net force is made up of an X component. This is the X component, 2.09 times 10 to the negative 5. And then its Y component is negative 2.09 times 10 to the negative 5. That would be this vector. 2.09 times 10 to the negative 5 is a negative Y. And we want to find the sum of the two. The magnitude of the force is, well, if you've got to complete that triangle, this is the magnitude. The magnitude will be square root of this squared plus this squared. So F equal to square root of 2.09 times 10 to the negative 5 squared, that is X squared, plus 2.09 times 10 to the negative 5, that is Y y squared and that will be 2.96 times 10 to the negative 5 neutral and that is this vector that is the net force on Q4 by all the other three forces all right what is the angle it makes with the x-axis theta if this is the angle theta then tan theta will be y divided by x this is my y and this is my x. So theta will be tan inverse of 2.09 uh, tan inverse of, you can see my y is negative and the x is positive. And that means you get negative 45 degrees. Is that right? Because this is a fourth quadrant angle. So we got the magnitude and the direction. And this is a pretty good way to solve problems like this. You see, the, all the skills we learned in adding vectors in Physics 1 is actually used here. I had told you during Physics 1 that we will use this in Physics 2. So if you have problems with this, you need to go back to Physics 1 and review some of this. Or, just get back to me, I can do more explanations if you need more explanations. Well, let's try one more problem. A point charge negative 2.5 microcoulomb is located at the origin. A second point charge of 6 microcoulomb is at x equal to 1 meter, y equal to 0.5 meter find the x and y coordinates of the position at which an electron would be in equilibrium. Have you understood this problem? The, the electron will be in equilibrium. Now look at the positions of the charges. A charge of negative 2.5 microcoulomb is located at the origin. That is my Q1. Q1 is negative 2.5 microcoulomb. 
a second charge of 6 microcoulomb is at x equal to 1, y equal to 0.5. You can see this is x equal to 1, that is y equal to 1. This point is x equal to 1, y equal to 0.5. Find the x and y coordinates of an electron, of the position of an electron at which the forces on the electron due to these two charges will be balanced. That is what it means. If the electron has to be in equilibrium, the forces on it must be balanced. That means the force on the electron due to Q1 must be equal to the force on the electron due to Q2. We need to find the X and Y components of the position of that electron. We need to find these values of X and Y. Alright, try and follow this carefully. The electron will be in equilibrium when the net force on the electron is zero. Now, that happens only when the electron is placed on a straight line with these two charges. It cannot happen anywhere else. I want you to think about it, alright? And if you have any questions, write to me. If Fe1 represents the force on the electron by the charge 1 and Fe2 is the force on the electron by charge Q2 that means when the electron is in equilibrium Fe1 plus Fe2 must be equal to zero is that right? the total force exerted by these two charges on the electron must be equal to zero. So what all we need to do is obtain an expression for Fe1 and an expression for Fe2, add them together, set it equal to zero and solve for this distance first. Find the distance of the electron from the origin and then we will figure out x and y of that position. All right, the distance between, first of all, let's find the distance between charges 1 and 2. Can you help me do that? If this distance is 1 and if this distance is 0.5, what is that distance? R12 will be, do it in mind, will be, this, this distance will be square root of the square of 1 plus the square of 0.5. Is that right? So R12 is the hypotenuse, which is the square root of square of this one plus the square of 0.5. That is 1.12 meter. So this distance is 1.12 meter. All right. Now remember, we are rooting for what distance? We need to find this distance. The distance of the electron from charge 1. That is what we want. So, if R1E is the distance of the electron from Q1, so this distance is R1E. Then what is the distance of the electron from Q2? It will be R1E plus 1.12. I hope you're following what I'm saying. If the distance of charge 1 from the electron is R1e, then the distance of the electron from the charge Q2 will be R1e plus 1.12. There you are. So you got R1e and R2e, the two distances. R1e plus 1.12 is R2e. Alright, let's use these two distances to find equations for the force due to Q1 on the electron and the force due to Q2 on the electron. Fe1 force on the electron due to charge Q1 is KQ1 times E. What does E stand for? E is the charge on the electron. Do you remember the charge on the electron? 
is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 column. All right, so that will be K is 9 times 10 to the 9. Q1 is 2.5 micro coulomb, convert that coulomb, times the charge on the electron is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19, divided by R1E squared. You've got to leave it like that because we don't know that value. We need to solve for that value. Now that will be, I calculated that, all right, you need to do it on your own. 3.6 times 10 to the negative 5 divided by R1e squared. That is the force on the electron due to the charge Q1. Similarly, let's find the force on the electron due to the charge Q2. It is KQ2e divided by R2e squared. Well, you know that distance, is that right? Tell me, what is that distance? R2e will be this plus this. K is 9 times 10 to the 9. Q2 is 6 micro coulomb. Is that right? And the charge on the electron divided by the square of R2e is R1e plus 1.12 all square. And simplifying that gives me 8.65 times 10 to the negative 5 divided by this quantity. And what did we say the condition is when the electron is in equilibrium, the sum of these two forces must be equal to zero. Do you want to take it as a challenge? Can you add these two, set it equal to zero and solve for R1e? Now if you want to take my challenge Turn off the video now and do that on your own. So, the magnitudes of these two forces are equal or the sum will be zero. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to set them equal to each other. Is that right? Because if when they add to give you zero, one is equal and opposite to the other. Since we are only looking for the magnitudes, I can say the first force equal to the second force. Is that right? All right. And now I have colored 10 to the negative 15 means they will cancel. There you are. And now I can cross multiply. 3.6 times this quantity equal to 8.65 times R1e squared. And now expand this. You know how to expand that. That will be the square of this plus 2 times this quantity times R1e plus R1e squared. You know how to expand a quantity like this. Equal to 8.65 times R1e squared. In the next step, distribute that 3.6, all right? And distribute the 3.6, move the right side to the left, and simplify, I got this equation. I'm going to leave that for you to work out on your own. Distribute the 3.6, move the 8.65 R1e squared to the left, then combine the like terms. What we have now is a quadratic in R1e. Can you solve that quadratic? This is a quadratic in R1e such that, look at that, ax squared plus bx plus c equal to 0. a equal to 5.05. b equal to negative 8.06 and C equal to negative 4.52. And what is the, the equation for the solution of a quadratic equation? R1e, which is our variable, negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a. 
and we have A, B and C and look at the way I have used A, B and C. Alright, watch it and see whether you understand it. Negative B plus or minus B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. And I simplified inside the square root and I got this. And that becomes R1E equal to 2.04. You see, you get two values, one positive and one negative. Now, R cannot be negative, so we only choose the positive value. So now you know that the distance of the electron from the origin is 2.04. Now, ignore the negative solutions because R1E cannot be negative. All right, now what do we have? We know this distance is 2.04 meter. We need to find the X and Y values. That's now very simple. If theta is the angle R1E makes with the negative X axis, if this angle is theta, tan theta will be X over Y. Is that right? Well, and this angle will be the same as that angle. Can you find that angle? Alright, tan theta will be opposite side is 0.5, adjacent side is 1, so tan theta is 0.5 divided by 1, that is 0.5. I hope you understood my argument. If theta is the angle made by this R1E with this negative x-axis, then this angle will be exactly equal to this angle. And tangent of that angle is, this is the opposite, 0.5, this is the adjacent, that is 1. Tan theta equal to 0.5 divided by 1, or tan theta equal to 0.5. That gives theta equal to tan inverse of 0.5, that is 26.7 degrees. So this angle is 26.7 uh, degrees, means this angle is 26.7 degrees. So, if I have, now, complete that triangle there. Now this is my X and that's my Y. So, you know this angle, this angle theta is 26.7 degrees. Therefore, this is R1E. This X will be this R1E cos theta, which is 2.04 cos theta. You see, X equal to 2.04 cos 26.7 degrees, which is negative 1.82 meter. X is negative. See, X is negative 1.82 meter and Y will be 2.04 sine 26.7 degrees that is negative 0.92 meter. So look at that. We took a long way to do that but we have now obtained the coordinates of this point which is negative 1.82 meter negative 0.92 meter. Now you must practice these problems. Very important types of problems and uh, you must be you know very well uh, well versed in calculating these kind of distances, forces, angles and so on. Alright, practice this on your own and we will see you for the next lesson a little later.